Indira Gandhi. Uh, Bucky, as he is more popularly known, is the inventor of the geodesic dome, and many of you may be aware of him. Bucky gave the third Jawaharlal Nehru Memorial Lecture in 1969, and um, the New York Times on the 15th of November reports that Buckminster Fuller, the American architect, etc., stood up this week before a gathering of Indian intellectuals to deliver a lecture on planetary planning. Mr. Fuller denounced society's perverse fixation on specialization. The more specialized society becomes, he says, the less attention does it pay to the discoveries of the mind. He met our first Vice Chancellor G. Parsayati, and this GP told me, anecdotal of course, uh, and he made a very deep impression on him, and some of these have gone on to form what we see here today. One of the things that GP told me about Bucky was that he brought him to this campus, which at that time was a wilderness, uh, and asked him how to develop it because this man was talking about planetary planning in 1969. And Bucky told him, leave it wild. Do not make it the, the manicured uh, South Delhi, in the Central Delhi uh, manicured vista of Lutian's Delhi. So Bucky is the one who saved us from being Lutian's style. <laughs> Uh, the other thing, of course, was the plea that he made at the Nehru Memorial Lecture, which was a plea for generalization. Specialization, as Bucky said, tends to shut off wide band tuning searches, that is his own invention, that prevented the discovery of all powerful generalized principles. I think that some of these ideas were crucial to uh, how GP thought and envisaged uh, the university because I know, again anecdotally, that he did consult a lot of people in setting up the various schools. The School of Social Sciences in particular had a great advantage because there were leading intellectuals here already. But there was a, both a physical and an intellectual wilderness in which he had to see some of the other schools. The School of Life Sciences started also at the same time as the School of Social Sciences, right at the beginning. But there were no uh, eminent biologists that uh, GP felt he could turn to. He asked instead uh, Obeid Siddiqui, who was then at the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, and others, to set up a plan for how the School of uh, Life Sciences should come about. And Siddiqui gave a very revolutionary idea, merge everything that's called botany, zoology, microbiology, whatever, into one, one school that would study the life sciences. In 1969, 1970, when it was being set up, this was extremely unusual. Even today, there are only many, many universities have departments of botany and zoology, uh, and not everybody has life sciences, so it was very important. The other science school that was started uh, is one of those stories of what might have been. Uh, some of you are, may be familiar with the name of George Sudarshan, who was a remarkable Indian physicist who remarkably missed the Nobel Prize twice. But he was talked about to start the school of what was then to be called theoretical and environmental sciences. George, after a lot of running around, eventually did not come uh, to JNU. And in his stead, uh, the person who was starting the School of Theoretical and Environmental Sciences was a physicist from Shanti Niketan, but who had earlier been at New Delhi, uh, at Delhi University, uh, S.N. Biswas. So the School of Theoretical and Environmental Sciences started with a group of theoretical physicists and then when Biswas left, it became the School of Environmental Sciences and then so on and so forth. But there is a small core of physics in uh, the School of Environmental Sciences. And these were two schools that started in the 70s along with the social sciences. SPS, the School of Physical Sciences where I belong, uh, did not start until 1986. And that was an idea of P. N. Srivastava that instead of doing 
physics, chemistry, mathematics, and the usual departments. Again, I think this goes back to Bucky's idea of, you know, do not specialize too much. Wanted a general school that would have these disciplines flourishing together. In the initial appointments in 1986, they did choose people from both physics and chemistry and mathematical physics. Uh, but in the end, finally, only three of us joined. Uh, Vaidyanath Mishra, who was the first dean, who was a mathematical physicist. Sushanta Dattagupta is a physicist, and I nominally am a chemist. Although sometimes one wonders, after Jamie particularly, I don't quite know where I fit in which little <laughs> anyway. But the point is that when we started SPS, the School of Physical Sciences, uh, many of the things that um, Romila has talked about, that Purushottam has talked about, Zoya, this was in our mind, you know, we were coming from very disparate systems. Yeah. I was coming from a research institute where there were no students or very few students. Suddenly to have councils where student representation was important, etc., was very, very unusual. Setting up syllabi, you did it in the 70s, Robert and you did it in the 80s, and it was a nightmare because this was a school that did both physics and chemistry. Uh, you know, not to mention mathematics and so on, you know, so we floundered, we did not, you know, we did not go the way that PM Shivasta wanted, but we went away. And in a few years, I think we made a remarkably good department. A remarkably good department that was actually able to uh, integrate with the other science schools uh, of the university, but also when we started out, um, the School of Arts and Aesthetics was started along with the School of Physical Sciences. And as you might imagine, um, Arts and Aesthetics, you know, what kind of a name is that? It says Arts and Athletics Hoka. <laughs> <laughs> and School of Physical Sciences, kya hota hai? School of Physical Education. Hai. So the thing was that JMU is not going to be a good thing. So, uh, but anyway, that, that was the early arts and aesthetics, uh, phase one, you know, phase two came on later. We did try very hard uh, to do many things, we didn't do everything well, uh, but in the 25 or so years that, uh, that, that I, was, I was with JNU for 32 years and I had a, we had a sort of a 25 year celebration of thinking about what had we accomplished. Some of the things that I think we did well was that at least in the initial years, we admitted students who had passed our exam. It didn't matter whether they were chemists or physicists or engineers or what have you. You, got, you wrote the entrance exam, you came in, you were in the School of Physical Sciences. So that was, I think, a very important thing because uh, that allowed a lot of people, I mean, we talked about diversity of gender, region, caste, there's also disciplinary diversity. You allowed people to change their minds. And, you know, having a mind is a wonderful thing, but also the ability to change it, that is extremely important. So we did allow for that kind of lateral move movement. I collaborated very intensely with colleagues in other schools, with life sciences, and as an outgrowth of that was uh, some work that we did in the area of bioinformatics that eventually led to the starting of the school of uh, what's now called the School of Computational and Integrative Sciences. Because in 2001, uh, Ashish Datta, who was the Vice Chancellor at that time, started uh, the School of Information Technology. It was a badly named school, but we were able to correct it many years later uh, to SCINS. But that was a need, again, we needed a place where uh, data and, sci and uh, com you know, uh, com computer science and information technology could all come together. And it was really founded on computational biology. Um, so, this was at least some of the origins of some of the science schools. Uh, in, you know, there's enough optimism, pessimism, etc., etc. What I feel that, you know, we should do also at a time like this, when Mosaic takes a view of the past, and you can see that there's enough of the spirit of JNU that is left. It is not that it is 
been vanquished completely. But it is in danger. And it is in danger both from external as well as internal, uh, uh, internal problems. One is, the, there is a certain smugness to being a JNU. That we do everything right. That, I think, needs for people to really think about because we are not doing everything right. A university which, after 50 years of existence and in a country with such glaring need, is only 8,000 students strong on a campus that is 1,000 acres, give or take. It is inclusive in whom it admits but it does not include everybody who needs education and needs to be admitted. So I really feel that we do, I mean, if I were to sing, the single point which I feel is that we have not grown. We have widened our arms and all that, but we have not grown as much as we should. 50 years in the life of a university which has been given so much public land and so much public trust at least until the last eight years or so. Um, we, it, it is something that we need to hold on to. And I hope that in the future, uh, that, you know, the law of large numbers will, will pay some dividends to all of us. Thank you.